Um, so I've been dabbling in the world of agriculture for, I worked out the other day, nearly 12 years, which is a bit scary because that's when I started doing my PhD at Birmingham, uh, vaguely trying to attempt to use GIS approaches to try and predict productivity, specifically in that instance, uh, for Roman agriculture of the late Republic and early Imperial. And what I was trying to do was to try and integrate documentary sources at the time, things like Cato, Varro, Columella, what the agronomists, the Roman agronomists were saying about agriculture and integrating it with archaeological and comparative sources to see if what they were saying was really the case, how would that impact settlement? How would that impact agriculture and production and, and things like that? Um, I was never very satisfied with it. Um, and sort of over the years, I sort of occasionally went back to try and think about better ways of approaching it and looking at how people were dealing with agriculture in, in, from lots of different angles. And so what I ended up trying to look at is how people in modern agronomy uh, look at agricultural data, both agricultural and pastoral data, and the sorts of things that they do, the sorts of approaches that they take within GISs or, or other methods uh, in order to pull out information about it. And it's an absolute minefield, I can tell you now. Um, there are so many different ways of looking at data, and a lot of these are what we call empirical approaches, which are all observation-based. Uh, and obviously, within modern agriculture, there are a lot of statistics around that you can, you can pull these sorts of information from. But obviously, in history, we don't have the benefit of that. And what we really need are sort of more mechanistic approaches that are based on physical principles, physical constraints. Uh, and so the way that I kind of looked at it was to try and generate conditions in which species, whether, whether they be plants, whether they be animals, could ideally persist and identify those, those locations. And then once you've got those models, you could then apply them to landscapes which might be traditionally more underrepresented, uh, underrepresented by observational data. And obviously there's certain countries, modern, that this applies to, but obviously especially with historical data sets, this is the case as well. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And this lovely thing is uh, something I came across, uh, which is actually from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And this is the GAIAS model. Uh, it stands for Global Agroecological Zoning. And this is a quite complex simulation, but actually it's got a quite nice portal at the front end. You can just go in, say, what crop do I want to know about? Um, what kind of uh, human management systems do I want to think about? Where am I interested in? And uh, it literally just pops out with uh, a map that looks a bit like this uh, and tells you how suitable that area is for certain types of agriculture. Um, I started, I've moved slightly across the Adriatic at the moment from Italy. I was based in Italy before uh, and as part of working with Vince Gaffney on some of his Adriatic Island stuff, this is hence me moving across slightly. Um, but you'll notice that because we're looking at such a small area, the resolution of this data set really isn't very useful to us. And so what I thought was that I sort of went into the guts of the model. It's a very, very complex simulation. And I thought, well, if I could pull out how they are actually performing this simulation, maybe I could try and use it on different types of data sets. So the bits I, I focused on are the agroclimatic data analysis, so, so coming up with that climate data in the first place, um, the sorts of things that stop crops from growing or, 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 or animals from surviving, um, and also uh, things like agroedaphic constraints, so soil terrain limitations that might, again, limit what, what's possible in certain areas. <laughs> and I took the challenge that I would only use freely available data sets, as usual, because what I wanted to come up with is a way of actually approaching these sorts of things. It's more of a method, methodolo uh, methodological approach. Uh, that could be then just, just freely applied anywhere. Um, turns out that most of these inputs are ones that actually go into the Gaia's model anyway. Uh, they just happen to also be free as well. So things like the World Klim climatic data sets, a uh, lot of, lot of temperature, rainfall, these sorts of things. Uh, the usual SRTM and ASTA elevation data sets. Uh, European soil databases as well. And there's quite a lot of also food and agriculture organization data sets as well. And obviously there are issues with this, which I will go into a little bit more detail in a minute. Obviously the resolution again, and also obviously the date of these data sets as well, which again I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So firstly, the resolution. 
uh, I wanted to try and build up these climate models. And this is what the World Climate Data Set looks like. This is the island of Vis, uh, just uh, off the Adriatic Islands, or just off the coast of Croatia. And so, again, what I kind of wanted to do was see if I could sort of up the resolution. So I did quite a lot of research into how climate models were generated in the first place. Turns out they're not quite so horrendous as we thought, and, and, and they're actually quite accessible in, in, in terms of what sorts of variables they're using. So uh, again, they're looking at these mechanistic principles, things like you know the higher it goes, the colder it gets, you know these sorts of standard things. So elevation, distance to coast, land sea ratios, all of these things that are quite easily generatable within a GIS. And so what I did was a sort of bit of regression krieging to try and reverse engineer these. Uh, so I sort of looked at what was the sort of the most likely variables that were going to impact these climates and then cheated a little bit using the Kruging to kind of account for these unknown variables that also uh, put it up. And so I turned that into that, uh, which, as you can imagine, is much more nuanced. How accurate it is has yet to be tested. Uh, but, and I said, I think I need to do a little bit more work on this in terms of getting this truly ready. But I think you can see that in terms of, you know, the sorts of things it can potentially tell us about more detail about landscapes, it should hopefully be quite good. Um, so having done that, I was, I was, I was more, so I just thought I'd say I was also more successful for getting good regression models for some um, climatic variables over others. And again, I need to just do a little bit more work on that to try and perfect it. Uh, so then I thought, well, you know, obviously then you're going to look at the uh, climatic limitations of certain different types of crops. So I looked into one of the sub-models of the Gaia's model, which is the FAO's eco-crop model. And they've got a big database, basically, that takes lots and lots of different types of crops, tells you the optimal growing temperatures, and as well as the absolute growing temperatures as well, as things like killing temps as well. And I took that and I just sort of did a sort of fuzzy classification using a you know, standard sort of trapezoidal membership function to create something that had a temperature suitability, uh, a rainfall suitability, and then sort of combined those together. And then for each individual crop, I was then able to apply that, uh, again, using those variables that I'd sort of upscaled, and ended up with, instead of that blocky image, uh, which was showing the one I showed before, which was rain-fed um, uh, bread wheat, this is now my bread wheat model. This, I've, I've sort of classified it into four seasons and you can see it's really not that suitable. I should have probably showed a more more suitable crop because actually spelt and barley do much much better in these areas than bread wheat but it, it shows you roughly how it's classified so that things are and aren't suitable for growth in different areas. So then went on to looking at the rest of the model, things like agroedific limitations Things like terrain, fairly standard. We're all used to looking at elevation, slope, and aspect in terms of erosion. The problem, for, it falls down a bit uh, when you look at the soils because obviously the Gaia simulation is based on very complex variables. It takes account of you know, oxygen, uh, rooting conditions, toxicity, all these kinds of things that, yes, in some cases, soils can be fairly stable in some countries, but in others, it's utterly not. And in you know, many areas, particularly here where you've got sort of karstic landscapes, where the soils are going to change very, very rapidly uh, in terms of uh, exploitation. So can we even use them? So I kind of thought, well, at this point, I definitely hit a barrier. Um, and I think this is something I'm going to have to come back to because I'm just not sure whether the climate alone is going to be good enough to, to give indicators about this. As again, as these models are very much in progress, I should say, that I'm, I'm still working on the best ways, which is kind of why I'm presenting it now. Um, and the other thing, obviously, is I'm using modern climate data. Um, there are, via the World Clim website, older general circulation models available. They've got something like, I think, 5,000 years ago. They've got the last glacial maximum. Models that, again, similar resolutions that you could perform similar uh, regression methods to try and up, upscale them. Uh, the problem was, as I was looking at the Roman period, and the 5,000 year ago model is probably further away temporarily than the modern data, so I thought, why worry? Um, but obviously, if we're looking at older periods, then this is something that you'd have to do. Um, the other thing is, obviously, crops themselves are not static. Um, the database itself, we have so much information because, obviously, these are the ones that have been uh, uh, cultivated a lot. There's obviously all over the world. Um, and it's a problem in terms of thinking about what are older cultivars like? What are their tolerances going to be like? And it's at that point you sort of think, 
or perhaps paleo-environmental work and experimental farming particularly might actually help us to get more information about that. <laughs> Turns out actually einkorn, one of the oldest ones, is actually seeing a resurgence at the moment because apparently I hear it's fairly gluten low. So we may well yet see more information coming that as that actually starts to get uh, uh, grown again in more, in more places. So again, this is not something that's necessarily a static thing. But I mean, my ideas are that even though that we might not have the perfect data sets to be working with, but the fact is, if we sort of come up with the, the model and approach, then once you've got those inputs, you can then apply them. <coughs> so I didn't just stop at crops, I went for animals as well. Um, as this is something that's, so I particularly interested with when I was looking at my PhD work because the complexity of the the models that I was having to create were, were, were very it was difficult to try and integrate all the different aspects of farming particularly subsistence farming where you're taking into account lots and lots of different types of activities <coughs> and again I started looking at how modern people look at uh, animal behavior animal you know the, the pastoralism and there's lots of things about habitat suitability modeling, but again, it's very much based on these observational based data. You know, you require abundance data, you GPS track your animals, you do all these sorts of things. And, and how relevant is that necessarily to past societies anyway? But then I stumbled across something which has always amused me, uh, which I've actually taken slightly to, to, to a different level now, actually. And that's the thermal comfort zones of animals. And uh, it's not something you never thought you'd be hearing in, in uh, CAA is the idea of a sheep heat index, but here it is, you're about to see it. Um, so basically there are quite a lot of pieces of information that about what sorts of thermal tolerances different breeds of animals can have. And here's just an example. Sorry, this is with the lower resolution data set, I'm afraid, because this was something I was mucking around with. Um, and here's just an example again of the Adriatic Islands where it shows those areas which either become too cold or too hot for these animals to persist in. Obviously, I've got fleece sheep and shorn sheep in as two separate things, but obviously they can be combined. Uh, goats do pretty well. Pigs are seriously in trouble. And uh, the idea behind this is it's not so much saying that, of course, no pigs are ever kept here, but the fact is, is that if they are going to be kept here, there are going to, you're going to have to rethink your economic strategy. You're going to have to think about things like, are you going to stall them? Are you, how, are you going to keep them in woodland? You know, obviously, because obviously the temperature will drop under certain sorts of situations. And so therefore, if you can kind of apply these things, it might give you some sort of indicator as to different ways, different uh, sort of different economic strategies that these guys might be carrying out. So just to show one in detail, this is the, this is the sheep. Um, and the top uh, map is showing the current census data for, uh, for, for the Adriatic Islands in Croatia. And uh, this is obviously just the hottest uh, area. And you'll notice that just some patterns that pop out is that uh, the island of Shalta is not particularly suitable for sheep. But then if you look at the census data, there aren't any there anyway. So perhaps this isn't so balmy after all. Um, the other pattern I noticed was this, because this is very much linked to the landscape. And this area in the middle, which is suitable, is also the uplands. And if everyone's hopefully all bouncing in their seats going, transhumans, transhumans, this is exactly what's going on. And that's what kind of happened to me. I was thinking, of course, because this is just sort of proving the reason why you have to go through these mechanisms in the first place. Um, so I thought uh, basically I would then go hop back over the Adriatic again, back to Italy, because the ideas of transhumans are so well documented there. It's so well ingrained sort of politically, ideologically in, into the economic systems. I thought, well, I'll have a look and see whether this pattern plays out there as well. So here's just some monthly uh, temperature. So here's my sheep heat index, in fact. And if I just take the coldest and the hottest months, here it is. Um, you can see in January, you've got obviously the um, alpine regions, obviously very, very cold. And I was chatting with a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who does study alpine transhumans. And it's very comforting to know that uh, he tells me that, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, that the alpine 
pastoral guys do actually, in those cold months, go down into those valleys, which are nicely suitable in my model, uh, and then go back up again afterwards. Um, I was obviously, we don't have the sort of very well documented transhumanist routes for up there, but it was nice that he could sort of corroborate this in a certain sense. Uh, but I was looking at this area down here where we do have very, very well documented routeways. And as you can see, these white areas, which are the route, uh, the transhumanist routes, which are still, I think, mostly used for motorcyclists now. Apparently it's a huge thing. Um, and so this is the area of this is a very, very long transhumanist route, which, as you can see, everyone sort of exits the very hot areas up into the mountains, uh, does a little circuit and comes back again. This is a good, good few hundred kilometers. But obviously this isn't just the only thing that's in play here. Obviously this is just one of many, many factors. And I mentioned woodland already. This is going to impact on uh, your... Uh, in terms of the overall temperature of a place, because obviously once you introduce elements of shade, it's going, it's going to uh, play into that. Uh, but also, um, you're going to need enough forage, you're going to need enough water to sort of feed those. I mean, there are millions and millions of sheep that are, are undergoing this, this sort of journey uh, every year. Mm. And I will also just point out as well that um, I forgot to mention earlier that the, the red areas and the, and the blue areas are not killing temperatures. They are temperatures beyond which their health is going to be adversely affected. So either through heat stress or cold stress. So things like reproductive levels, amounts of milk that you can produce are going to be drastically reduced if you stay in those areas for too long or you don't have some sort of strategy for alleviating it. So they're not a quickly kind of quick, quick alarm bells get out very, very quickly or you'll die. Uh, there is a sort of general sort of factor of, you know, obviously there are, you know, it allows time for movement and, and things to happen. It's not going to be instantly. If you stay here too long, you're in a big danger zone. Um, so <coughs> aside from that, as I say, I was thinking about sort of broadening that out and looking at things like the vegetation and the water. And uh, I came across quite, again, another minefield of information about how moisture is is dealt with. And one of the models I found was uh, the Integrated Moisture Index, which is old, pretty old now, 1997, um, which took uh, originally took hill shades as a, as a proxy for evaporation, curvature to sort of see where water would collect and where it wouldn't, uh, flow accumulation and uh, available water capacity of the soils themselves to see, and then it, they were sort of integrated to try and determine which areas would have most... Um, water over others. I kind of did uh, a modified IMI, or, or a Mimi, as I like to call it, uh, whereby I thought, well, instead of using a proxy for evaporation, why don't I just use evaporation? Well, we actually have freely available evapotranspiration, so not just evaporation, but also the use of the sort of sucking up of, of, of it by, by crops as well, and that's freely available, so that's just a sort of like-for-like -like, uh, change. But I also found that the original model was um, basically it was, it was based on quite a small area. It was looking at trying to look at woodland. And obviously, I'm looking on a national scale here. So we're going to have they didn't originally take account of rainfall, which is obviously going to have quite a big impact on moisture availability. So um, a couple of years ago, the Journal of Archaeological Science, somebody had come up with, uh, uh, Brett Skertel came up with plant available water model, which was kind of based on flow accumulation and topography, uh, but obviously trying to integrate rainfall as well. So again, I sort of subbed that one in as a test as well to see what the impact would be. Obviously, this is, this is a, a model in progress. It needs testing. I need to try lots of different things out. Uh, but this is what she looks like uh, it, when she actually put her all together. Um, and again, obviously, there's different ways of weighting it to, to bring it together, and I'm going to have to test that out as well. Um, and if you sort of just roughly classify that into sort of, well, just I've just divided it into sort of wet and well, relatively wetter and drier, uh, and compare it with those those temperature areas. Obviously, there's a big strong correlation with the area of the Apennines. I mean, it's not really a surprise, uh, but I think. It'd be quite nice to sort of take this a little bit further, try and think about what other sorts of factors that we could bring into it and say this is a work in progress. Um, but I think it's quite a nice start, at least, to try and actually think about these sorts of things. Um, because I think it does have quite a lot of potential. I think somebody yesterday said, 
obviously put the humans back in the landscape. I was like, well, I'm trying to put the sheep back in the landscape in, in a big way. Um, and obviously, you know, in the past, I mean, at least in the Roman period, 90 to 95% of the population are engaged in food production. This is not an insignificant number, a you know, percentage of the population. So I kind of would like to sort of develop it a little bit more. So whether the heat ind indices and, and Mimi are indicators of potential transhumanist routes. So if it works in Italy, could we then apply it to less well documented areas and see how that pans out? Uh, you can use it as factors in other kinds of cost path analysis. So I know at least, in fact, this exact area was done as a cost path analysis in a CAA a couple of years ago. And if you can bring these factors in as other kinds of variables, what impact would that have on it as well? And um, the other sorts of things I was thinking about as well is you know, if, you, if you've got assemblages of animal bones of different types coming from sites and these happen to fall in inappropriate index areas, then what does that potentially tell us, well, could, what could that potentially tell us about the economic strategies that they're going to have to put into place to make that more suitable for this to happen? Or are they just going to accept that the milk is going to be a bit less, as one way or another? So... I think this is, I say, this is very much first step. So even though I've been dabbling with it for a long time, I'm only really now coming back to this. And I think it has quite a lot of potential in terms of, uh, you know, what it could actually bring to, you know, studies of, you know, uh, rural life in general. Uh, but I admit that obviously there is quite a long way to go. So, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So obviously the first stage is to try and think about these climate models. Can we refine them? If I apply them to, to prehistoric circulation models, are these patterns going to be the same or are they not going to be the same? It'd be interesting to try and use these. Um, just out of interest, there's also a future circulation models available as well. So who knows what that could be. Um, obviously the other area, we've got to look at things like crop tolerances. I'd very much like to improve the ecological modeling, see if I can get more information for older cultivars and what impact that's going to have about what is and isn't appropriate to be, to be grown in certain areas. And then of course, then I can go back to my previous modeling and think about, you know, if I've now got this information, you know, what is the impact of climate on things like yields, uh, you know, and how can I integrate it all together in terms of you know, are you able to create surpluses? What impact does that have on your society as a whole? And in terms of uh, the animals, obviously, I'd love to look at the transhumans in more detail, see if I can apply it to different types of areas and try and build more nuanced models of movement. And obviously, in the same way that we're using modern crops here, I was using modern animals here. So again, it's great as a quick index to see what isn't, isn't available. But obviously, even between modern sheep breeds, there's going to be a lot of difference in hardiness between uh, different types of animals and so I think there's a lot of work that I need to go and have a look at so older breeds hairier breeds whatever where I'm ever going to go so um, these were just some random pie in the sky thoughts probably completely bamboozled everybody with I was like why on earth are we talking about sheep uh, but uh, it would be really interesting to see if people think I'm completely insane or whether you think this actually has legs or not because I do think obviously given the the primacy of agriculture in the past, why are we not looking at this in more detail? So uh, I've probably waffled long enough, it's five o'clock. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thank you.